right? And then, donated by the Rotary Club. Woo! The Ten Commandments. And a 5 4 decision, this is one of those accommodation questions. The Supreme Court said, eh, this is kind of the people of Texas with all these different things saying this is where we come from. So it's a real question what's culture and what's religion? And they're saying, this is it with a whole bunch of other stuff that adds up to this. It's not by itself, it's not singled out, it's not a place where decisions are made. We're going to say, I for that this is okay. Now, in Oklahoma, we had a similar situation shortly after that. A private company that got approval from the state legislature, a private, not company, but nonprofit organization, that got approval from the state legislature put right next to the state doors the Ten Commandments. That did not make it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That did not make it to the U.S. Supreme Court. It made it to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And it got struck down at the Oklahoma Supreme Court for being unconstitutional in Oklahoma because of something significant. Oklahoma law specifically states that state funds and land cannot be used for religious purposes. That's in the Constitution. And so, for example, last week, Governor Stitt in his State of the State address said, we're going to start giving vouchers to students going to private schools. It works in other states, it should work here. But in Oklahoma, what's the problem? They can spend on a religious school. And if they don't spend on a religious school, then that's discrimination. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if they spend it on a religious school, then they're clearly abrogating the Oklahoma state constitution. The First Amendment, right away, the very second thing it talks about is free exercise. And this is why we have a competition. Government cannot interfere with religious practice. So even as a state employee, right, then I have the right to engage in religious practice and I cannot be punished or fired for doing so. It's not absolute. Necessity can absolutely outweigh freedom. There's no question about that. And there are several practices that have been uh, not given, given constitutional protection. Now, three of them have the same reason. Snake handling by minors, polygamy, and restriction of medical care to minors. What's the reason for those laws? They specifically all pose danger to children, okay? And so we see a lot of things that protect children. And so even if I am 17 years old and I say, hey, look, I honestly believe that in order to show my faith, I need to handle poisonous snakes. There is a state interest in protection of minors that overcomes parental permission on that. Okay? You can only decide to do that if you're 18. If I fully believe that having a surgery or a blood transfusion, okay, would cause me a problem, if it is life or death, I do not get to make that choice, and my parents do not get to make that choice if I'm under 18. Now, the last one, oh, polygamy. Um, you know, polygamy has kind of a history where you have, yeah? Sorry, I just had a quick question about that example. Um, I don't know the religion, but I know that they don't like having blood transfusions because like, it, they feel like it impurifies their blood. Yes, or witness. something like you that. have a witness. So if a, if a child under 18 needs blood to live, they, the state can put blood into them against even if the kid didn't want it? Yes. Okay. Yes, if it is a life or death situation. Okay. And it's the same with surgery, it's the same with, um, you know, Christian scientists are going to say no extraordinary medical care. If you're a minor, you and your parents don't get to make that decision. Polygamy. There's a 
long history of, you know, 11, 12 year old girls being married to become one of 17 wives of 50 year old men. And polygamy laws were passed to protect them. Use of illegal drugs is a little bit different though. Its rationale is different. First of all, who's Kwana Parker? Can anybody tell me? Who's Kwana Parker? That's right. And the last in their phone. Well, before last three teeth, I guess that was it. I'm going to There we go. So Kwana Parker began the Native American church. Kwana Parker begins the Native American church because he's injured. In one of those we're talking about on Wednesday, right? The wars uh, waged by the U.S. government against uh, against Native American tribes, right? And he's injured. And on the battlefield, he is administered peyote by a medicine man, a shaman, in order to put him somewhere else so he can fix his leg, essentially, right? Just a as kind of an anesthetic. But whenever he went under the influence of peyote, he saw Jesus Christ, and he saw the beginnings of what the Native American church could be. And so, peyote has become a part of the rights of the Native American church. Smith, who was a member of the Native American church, was also someone who worked as a drug counselor for the state of Oregon. And he went on, you know, into a sweat lodge, had a vision quest, ingested peyote for religious purposes. And when he tested positive for peyote, he was fired. And that was under Oregon state law. Now, at the state Supreme Court of Oregon, they said, you can't do that. That's clearly interfering with religious practice. Sincerely held beliefs. Okay? But the U.S. Supreme Court overturned it. And they said, you can't use illegal drugs because we have a bigger interest in stopping illegal drug trade. And that overcomes these sincerely held religious beliefs. Congress was furious and they passed the law. Anybody know what it was? The Religious Freedom Restoration Act, so RIPRA, which we see come back later in Hobby Lobby, we'll talk about that later. But you see it come back, and Congress, said, and specifically the Supreme Court says, hey, look, you can't. It's checked, you know, there are laws that are challenged as a part of this. And the Supreme Court says, you can't tell us what to find, we tell you. We're the one who says what's constitutional or unconstitutional. And so Smith versus Oregon. Uh, Oregon versus Smith, sorry, is one of these that don't fit there. Now, next section. Eric, can you take roll? Yeah. Free speech and press. Eric is going to take roll. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Just like with religion, that does not mean there are no limits. But freedom of speech and press is a legal concept that we hold very strongly and we cannot abridge it. As a matter of fact, you guys looked at where the United States ranks in terms of democracy early on. You guys remember this? It wasn't pretty. Okay? But one of the things that we do particularly well is freedom of speech. Noam Chomsky says this, and I want you guys to think about this. If we don't believe in freedom of expression for people we despise, then we don't believe in it at all. Now, I want you to think of some people that say things that make you crazy angry. Okay? That go against things you believe strongly. You have to believe in their freedom of speech. Last week on campus, we had um, I think we did have a preacher with a bullhorn. Freedom of speech. But I am certain that that preacher with the bullhorn did not say things you all like. That all of you like. 
We also had a group that was um, against abortion and a counter protest. It was for abortion rights. Freedom of speech. No matter which side you're on. You have to believe in it for everybody or you don't believe it. There are some limits. So this is a Miller test for obscenity. We're going to learn some new words. Because obscenity is super fun. Alright? The average person applying contemporary community standards, in other words, here. What are the standards here? Finds the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. Prurient is your word of the day. What does prurient mean? Yeah. No. Korea? No. Sexually perverse. Okay, Korea is sexually perverse. And I want this to be really clear to you guys. Because look, right here, we define obscenity as related to sex. In the United States, under our legal jurisprudence, sex is what we define as obscene. Violence is not defined under obscenity statutes. Okay? But also, the work has to depict or describe in a patently offensive way sexual conduct that is specifically defined and also illegal by state law. Most states do not allow you to have sex with goats. And so there are laws that specifically say you cannot have sex with animals. Right? And so if there is a law that says you cannot have sex with animals and there is the fine if you do do that, right? Then it's specifically defined by state law. If I write a book about people, a culture that exists in Oklahoma, wherein it's a regular thing to have sexual relations with sheep, am I violating this? Is it obscene? So far, I would say yes, right? I'm talking about a sexual act, I'm describing a sexual act, that's illegal, and it appeals to the perverse interest. But there's an ant. And here's the ant. The work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So I'm writing this as a research on these practices, right? And so it's of value, whether it be artistic or literary, political or scientific, and well, that's different. Yeah. Well, and, and for example, they have generally kind of limited this to large cities. In this large city, what do we consider to be Korean, right? Or states, okay? Um, so that's what the community standard is. But what's important about that community standard, and I'm glad you asked that, is it only applies to this top one. Okay? It does not apply to this bottom one. There was recently a Supreme Court case in which that was challenged saying, hey, we need to apply the community standard to is this really serious literary artistic work? And the Supreme Court said no. Right? That's judged by academics, by people in that field, as to what that is. Okay? That's why like the National Enquirer can get away with so much. Um, yeah, sure. And also libel slander, which we're getting to in just a second. So there are some pretty hard rules. First of all, no prior restraint. That means no censorship. Okay. If I contact the Pentagon and say, "So I got some papers. They were given to me. They show that the way that you executed the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, has some problems. I'm going to print it. Do you have any comment? They can't stop me from printing." It. Now, if after I print it, it turns out to have 
national security implications, like I have really endangered national security, then I can absolutely be tried for that. Okay? But they can't stop me from printing it. Political speech is protected. Almost anything you say under the guise of political speech is going to be protected by the First Amendment, more so than anything else. Symbolic speech is protected. You see Texas versus Johnson. Um, in that particular case, Johnson burns a U.S. flag on the state capitol grounds in Texas to protest U.S. actions in Nicaragua. The Reagan administration's actions by mining the harbors of Nicaragua, specifically after Congress told them not to and they weren't allowed to. Hate speech is protected. Brandenburg versus Ohio. And there's a higher standard to prove libel or slander if you're a public person. I am not a public person. Even though I teach big classes, and at the University of Oklahoma, a lot of people know me, I'm not a public person. If, however, I did a weekly radio show where I talked about Oklahoma politics, I move into that realm. In which case, in order for libel or slander, you have to prove that it's untrue, number one, and then number two, it hurt the person. So either monetarily, or because of their reputation, or they didn't get a job, right? That's what you have to prove. But, if you are a public person, you have to prove something else. That it was done with malice, okay? That it was done with malice. There are limits on speech and press, time, place, and manner. So that's public order. So I can say, in our classroom, we will treat each other with decorum, and I will throw you out if you use hate speech. And I can do that. Okay? National security, clear and present danger, conflict with another liberty. So, a lot of times, judges and issues, a judge will issue a gag order on a jury or on witnesses or on the press during a jury trial to make sure that person gets a, free trial, a fair trial. Libel, slander, and incitement. If someone libels me, I am not a public person, and it's false, and it harms my reputation, I lose my job, I can sue them for that incitement. That is, if someone acts on someone's wishes pretty immediately and harms another. So for example, as your cult leader in this room, right, if I were to say to you, I think it'd be really cool, man, if you took all those sticks and stuff I have by the door and went and beat up everybody in the administration building. Right? That's incitement if you then do it. And also, if clearly I was inciting you to do that. Right? But you have to act on it. You have to act on it. Obscenity, which we've already talked about. We also have a right to peaceably assemble. Groups and demonstrations oftentimes give power to ideas. Right? The more people gather, the more that idea grows. Whether it's an idea you agree with or not. Individuals engaging in mass communication are often powered by sweat equity. This idea that I am willing to show up somewhere and put myself behind that. It's also protected if it's unpopular or hateful. Right? And I gave you guys this example in your workbook last week. Skokie and the neo-Nazis. Understand that in Skokie, it was had a large population of people who had survived the Holocaust. And the neo-Nazi party came and said, hey, we want to have a parade? And Skokie said, no. The Supreme Court said, you have to let them. Right? They have to get a permit, but you have to let them be there. We also have the right to petition the government. This is more important historically, but it's recently, in this digital age, become important as well. So, you know, the Indian tribes would petition Congress and they would read it out loud. We would petition when we were colonists, the king, right? But now they just tend to be entered into the record and nobody reads them. But letters to electors is a way that we see people petitioning. And I think, really more specifically, 
a recent case that I really like is from uh, President, former President Trump's Twitter account. He started blocking people that didn't agree with him on his Twitter account. And the Supreme Court said, no, you're using that as an official communication channel, which means that people have the right to petition you in the way that you see it. You cannot block people on your Twitter channel. So, get ready for poll. 